Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest. We've got Kurt Jordan. Kurt, appreciate you coming on the show. Darren, really appreciate the invite. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. So just a little bit on how I know Kurt. So we kind of run in the same circles. We're, you know, both um, syndicators in the in the DFW area. And, um, you know, there's different meetups and different conferences and we've run into each other. And, and he actually partnered on a deal with another multifamily syndicator that I'm good friends with, um, Aaron Katz. I had him on the episode, episode 31. And, um, you know, since then, he's just been crushing it. So I am so looking forward to hearing how he's doing and um, how he's making it happen. So with that, um, typically, first question, how many properties and how many units are you invested in? So I've purchased seven properties and uh, almost 1,200 units now as a general partner. Seven properties and 1,200 units. And that's yes, over a span of how long? Uh, I closed on my first property in March of 19. So okay. I guess a little over two years now. No, is that right? Yeah, almost, no, three years, three years. Uh, three years. Um, that's crazy how quickly. So I saw, you know, talk about the first deal and like why why'd you partner with Aaron and, um, you know, did you feel like you had to partner with somebody? And then we'll get into kind of how you scaled after that. So my first deal actually was not with Aaron. It oh, it was wasn't a deal. Okay. It was a deal with a, another Aaron that you don't know. Um, actually, it was when I was at a W-2 job uh, and it was a 35 unit deal in Mineola, Texas, if you know where that's at. I do not. Where is it? It's it's north of Tyler. OK, so uh, Tyler yeah, so, <laughs> so I had had some single family homes uh, at this point. Uh, and was looking to scale up and uh, was a podcast junkie. And so I listened to some Bigger Pockets podcast and uh, was introduced to the Old Capital podcast. And I uh, went to a, a conference of theirs uh, back in October of 18. And uh, I was like, man, I like this multifamily stuff that they're talking about. It, I, I like the idea of scaling. And um, so I saw that Marks and Millichap had a 35 unit deal out in Mineola. And, um, basically just went for it with a, with a coworker of mine. Uh, we were going to take it down ourselves initially. Uh, um, but then we learned about syndication and it's like, well, why don't we just go ahead and just give this a try, the syndication thing a try. And if we, if we can raise the funds, great. And if we can't, then we'll just take it down ourselves. And we were able to raise the funds and, um, so closed on that deal in, uh, in, uh, again, March of 19, and uh, also about that time, I, I joined the Sumrock group and then learned about bigger syndications. And that's when I kind of realized that maybe it was good to, um, to partner with someone who could maybe kind of help me get over the finish line on, on a bigger deal. And that's where Aaron Katz came into play. And gotcha. that's where the second deal came into play. And that which, second uh, deal was, was much larger than the 35 unit. It was. Um, so just kind of a timelines here. So I closed my first deal in March of 19. And then uh, I actually left my corporate job in July of 19, way, well before we had the second deal. And it was kind of one of those things that I, I in a sense, kind of burned my boats, if, if you've heard <laughs> of that phrase. Uh, right. So because I wasn't making a lot of income off the 35 unit deal and just kind of, you know, uh, made some family decisions and how was the um, wife with that decision? She was, my wife is awesome. Okay. She supports me awesome. probably, uh, <laughs> too much. I could say it's kind of, sometimes it's a little stressful just how much she supports me, but it's amazing. Cause I know not, not every spouse, uh, will, would be okay with something like that, but we had money saved up and, um, we were ready to kind of make that, that next, uh, that next change in life. And, um, I had always liked real estate and was entrepreneurial and, um, so, uh, but yeah, it took us, uh, we joined the Sumrock group back in March of 19. And then I didn't actually close on the Avalon Villas deal, that 265 unit deal until November of 2020. 
So it actually took us about a year and a half at that point to actually find that, that, that first large deal after the 35 unit deal. It took you a year and a half to find it? Uh, we entered a contract in June of 2020. So right after the COVID stuff occurred, um, and then it was a several month closing. And, but we did, like I said, we didn't close until November of 2020. Wow. So you said a, a number of different things that I think are, are really important for, you know, listeners to understand. One is, uh, well, you didn't use this word, but you, you had curiosity that you actually went at, were listening to podcasts, you were looking at bigger pockets website. Um, and you know, for the listeners benefit, that's a great real estate investing website. If you haven't been to it, um, called bigger pockets. Um, but then, so you got out there, you know, and then you went to a conference, you went to the old capital conference and you were listening to old capitals podcast. Um, you know, you started educating yourself. You started building that curiosity and then, you know, what differentiated you from a lot of people, though, is is you actually took action after that, you know, where a lot of people, they will listen to the podcast, they'll read the books, they might even go out to some conferences, but then pulling the trigger can, you know, can be scary. How'd you pull the trigger? Uh, so it kind of, uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, my job, honestly, my W two, I loved it, and it provided me great opportunities. Uh, I, I was worked for a tax consulting firm um, and did sales tax there, and uh, uh, managed a pretty good sized team. But you know, I looked at my future at that company and, and saw the uh, time that it was going to require. And I don't don't get me wrong, I don't mind working. I'm gonna work very hard at this particular job, but um, I saw. Uh, people who are maybe higher up who maybe didn't get to spend as much time with their family. And, um, you know, for me, family was really important. My spouse was really important. And at the time in 2019, I had a, a little over one year old and, uh, you know, I was, I was leaving, getting to the office at like six o'clock in the morning Holy cow. and then, and then, uh, getting home or leaving the office at five, which was, you know, early to some standards, just so I could get home at six and just spend an hour with them before he went to bed, right. which, you know, if you know, it's, it's it was a cheap hour at that point because you know I'm still kind of decompressing from the day and all that kind of, um, all that kind of bit. And so, uh, what kind of got me to pull the trigger was when we did the 35 unit deal. I just again started learning more about syndication and kind of gained some confidence that I could do it. And uh, at that point, again, uh, probably still didn't know what I was getting myself into, um, but it was one of those things that I was I was. Uh, ready to, 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 to take action there. I, I kind of, I wanted to be able to look, look back in my life and, you know, be able to say that I, that I, that I tried something here. Um, I, I, I didn't want to be, you know, 20 years down the road and, and, you know, still be so super successful in the W2 job, but wonder, Hey, what could it have been if I had gone out and done something on my own? Oh man, um, that's, that's huge. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I, I believe that are out there that feel that way you know, that are in jobs that look, granted there's, there are people out there that love what they do and, and, you know, they're climbing the corporate ladder and making great money and, and that's great. But I believe there's also a lot of people that they have that itch, they have that, you know, urge in their belly, but they're just afraid to take action, you know? And, but what, one thing you said though, I, you know, and I, and I did it too, was look, you, you had some money saved up, you know, um, that's the part that I think prevents people from being able to take a chance. You know, I back in, so I started my, I have another company that trades loan portfolios and I started that company in 2007, but 2002 to 2006, I was making great money, you know, as an employee and I just kept socking money away. And I said, after this job, when, you know, when this kind of gravy train r runs out, I don't want to ever work for somebody again. Right. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, they buy the nicer car, they buy the nicer house and they, you know, they're actually handcuffed to, you know, to their bills and it yep. makes it very difficult to take that chance. So, so you did some planning that you actually saved some money up and you felt like you had a chance to, to go after it. 
That's that's right. And and to be honest with you, even looking back at it now, multifamily is an expensive uh, expensive game to get into. Uh, you know, I, you learn things along the way. But uh, now, if I was to do it again, I would probably have more saved, <laughs> more money saved up because you know earnest money deposits plus living expenses. And you know, for the Avalon Villas deal, I mean, we we put down one percent uh, of the purchase price, which was you know. 300 something thousand dollars plus other, you know, cost due diligence cost. And, you know, that's, uh, that's hefty, um, to be sitting in, uh, you know, a, a title, uh, for, you know, at that time it was three months. And again, I told you, we, we went a year and a half without, uh, before we closed on that deal. So basically I had to have, we were living off of a, a, you know, a year and a half of our savings and had all that money tied up at title, um, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, and I I think that um, so I'm I passively invest and I'm also a general partner and and you probably have done the same. Um, people that have just passively invested or are looking to passively invest for the first time, I don't think that they realize you know the you know the risk that the sponsor takes on the deal. You know they look at it like they just want my money to be part of this deal, um, but. You know, sponsors aren't going to get into a contract on a deal that they don't feel confident that they they can make a good return on because, <laughs> or that they can raise the capital for because, like you said, I mean, you had hard money of three hundred k. Then there's yes, yeah. you know the mm-hmm. application fee for the lender. There's the uh, inspection fee, appraisal fees. So all of that is fronted by sponsors. And then when the deal closes 60 days or 90 days or 120 days later, you know, you're, you're refunded for that, but you're out of pocket. And if the deal doesn't close, you're at risk. That's right. That's right. So it's a, it was a little stressful. And again, going back to just talking about how awesome my wife was and, you know, she was support, really supportive of this whole situation. Cause again, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was tight. It was tight there for the first year and a half, you know, people, what did she say that was supportive? (laughs) Um, she just believed in me. I mean, she believed that we were going to get through it and, you know, um, and then also too, we look back to our faith, uh, you know, and, and God in, in this situation. I mean, before we made this move, there was many prayers that went up and uh, say, is this, is this a move that we need to make here? And we felt confident that it, that it was uh, just kind of based on some guidance that we felt like we received. And, that, and we were, even though it was really stressful, we were still at peace with the whole situation. And um, we knew that we were going to get taken care of in, in whatever situation that we ended up in. And because um, what our faith, you know, says that we will be it will be taken care of in some capacity so even if we went bankrupt uh we knew that we would still have food in some in some way we would still find housing in some way we would still be taken care of in some way um and that kind of gave us some peace to the situation and it continues to give us peace now even yeah, that's huge i i got like chills when you were saying that you know, because <laughs> look i mean it especially the first deal or two can be very stressful And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you can lean on something, you know, like your faith to, to give you peace during a very challenging time, um, that that's huge. And, you know, I've interviewed a lot of syndicators that have, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of units. Um, and most have said, like when I say, talk, ask them about fear and how they, you know, push through it. A lot of them have said the same thing. They said, um, you know, I thought about what's the worst thing that could happen, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? And you just said it, like, well, you know, okay, if the deal fell apart, like, you know, money's money. You, you'd find a place to live. You'd find food That's somehow. Right. You would, you know, you'd be provided for, and you know, so that a lot of people kind of have had that question that they threw out to themselves, and then they say, you know, what's the upside and what's more likely to happen exactly and yep. you know the upside is more likely to happen than the, than the downside and you know i'm going to take this chance and um because nobody does have a crystal ball i mean there's you know it, it it could come out great or it could be you know a difficult situation um but the people that have excelled um you know took some risk somewhere in their life 
Yep. No one, uh, not all, I mean, everyone talks about the, uh, the iceberg, right? Underwater, like you don't see all the stuff that goes on below the surface, but there really is a lot that goes on below the surface. And, uh, a lot of people see the successes, but there really is a lot that, so talk, that happens so, behind the scenes. So talk about some of the stuff under the water, under the water, the iceberg under, under. Oh, we've been talking about some of it already. <laughs> Uh, it's hard. Um, it's hard to find deals. It's hard to raise money. It's hard to, you know, get deals over the finish line. Um, I mean, it's all hard. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride. Entrepreneurship is a roller coaster ride. There's it, even within the same day, you can have such highs in certain some days. And then the, that same day you could have massive lows. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's uh, it's a tough game. <laughs> see, see, I, you, people who are listening can't see, but I have no hair, <laughs> but here, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, funny story on that. I went to get my license renewed and the, and the lady said, you know, what, what color hair do you want me to put down? And I'm like, well, it's either, either <laughs> brown or gray. And, and I said, well, if you ask me, it's brown. If you ask my kids, it's white. And, and, and she <laughs> said, I would put down gray. And I'm like, I can't do it. Put down brown. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So. Yep, yep. So anyway, I mean, like we're still young at heart, right? Our, in our minds. Right, that's right. Minds. That's right. Um, but it is hard, you know, but the thing to, and I want to get your take on this, is that mm -hmm. what you thought was hard in the first deal is different in the seventh deal. It is, although I'm not doing 35 unit deals in my seventh deal. So that's one thing too, I'm stretching. Like, so I just closed on a deal uh, this week and it was a 651 unit portfolio deal. So that's a little bit different than a 35 unit deal, which had its challenges. So one thing I've, I've liked to be able to do is just continually stretch myself and see what I can do. Um, and uh, that this last deal that we closed certainly did that. It was a almost $25 million raise, wow. uh, which is a lot, um, certainly more than the $500,000 raise in my first deal. <laughs> um, so, uh, but that, that's but yeah, exciting, but you, know, yeah. you know, that's exciting. It is. It is. And look, as an entrepreneur, I think that that's where, that's where we, you know, get the juices flowing is like, is mm -hmm. going after something that is a little bit more than we've done before. You know, that is, is it that stretch that is, that is part of that journey, that growth. And yet that's the scary part, but it's also the exciting part. That's right. That's right. So, well, good for you that you have a wife that's, um, you know, supportive because, you know, it, it, it can be challenging. And if you, if you have a spouse that isn't completely on board, that just would add to pressure and the stress and everything else associated with it. So you close on the first deal and then the second deal, you go bigger. Um, at that point you decide that you, you want to scale, right. And you want to do more deals. So talk to us yep. about that. Yep. So honestly, I don't know that I really thought I was going to scale big until really like, well, really until like a couple of months ago, to be honest with you, because I think there's two different, like I came to a kind of a fork in the road here. It was kind of, do I want to keep doing these kind of one-off deals? Um, because at that time, so I, I did the 35 unit, then a 265 we mentioned, and then I did a 54 unit, then a 71, then a 16, then a 136. And, and then at that point I was kind of like, man, what do I, what do I want to do with this here? Do I want to, again, just kind of do these one-off kind of deals or do I want to create a firm and really just kind of go into this? And so um, several months ago, I guess it was three or four months ago, I actually had a meeting with uh, with, with Merrill Callister and John Montero. Oh, good. <laughs> and, uh, and those guys basically... Uh, to their credit, they, they looked at me and it's like, man, what do you, what do you want to do? And um, it's like, well, I don't know. I think I want to keep building this out. And they're like, well, how many people do you have working for you? And I'm like, well, none. And John was like, well, you're, it's like, you're prohibiting yourself from growing. He's like, you're the bottleneck in this thing. And I'm like, well, that is such good advice. And uh, I am the bottleneck. So since that time, I've actually gone out and hired three people. Um, so, uh, our, we have a little firm of four people now. Um, cause I, I was like, man, I, I just want to grow this thing. And so, uh, that's, like so we got the 650 unit deal, which, you know, these, my, my team has certainly helped along the way there. 
Um, so I have an asset manager and I have a, uh, acquisitions guy and I have an investor relations guy and all, all of them have just been amazing, um, so far, um, to help us with the, with the growth and looking to continue to grow with this team. That's, that's fantastic. That's what I was going to ask you is, is like, one, are you hiring people and two, you know, in what capacities? And you just, you just answered that. So, um, <laughs> Have you seen that bringing in those people as um, just freed you up? Almost. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, t- it takes a little bit of time to onboard people completely, but uh, we're, we're, we're definitely making strides. Um, I've definitely seen, um, I, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, my asset manager is out driving our properties every two weeks, which is great. Um, and he's putting together reports for me, which is super helpful. Uh, and then my my acquisitions guy is basically underwriting a couple properties a day, which I, I know is, as you as you syndicate deals, it's 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 impossible to underwrite every oh, deal absolutely. that comes to your way. It's just so uh, so having that help has been super helpful. Um, and he's he's a really smart guy. I mean, all of them are really smart. So how does that that They're work? Um, your acquisitions guy is getting. You've got him on the email distribution for all with all the brokers, mm-hmm. and then uh, the deals are coming in. He's underwriting the deals, and then he's That's just right. bringing the ones that have some merit to your attention. That's it. That's exactly it. And so, and we've been going over. And he's he's coming from a, a company where he was doing some more mixed use underwriting. Um, so this is a little bit different, but he understands modeling financial modeling really well. And uh, so this, this has been a good fit for him so far. And, uh, but yes, he essentially does call it 95% of it and then says, Hey, I want to look at this deal with you. And then we go over the last 5% together, which again, that's super helpful for me because it helps me think about how I want to grow the business and actually work on the business as opposed to being working in the right. business. And you said that, um, you know, you, you thought about it and then you made a conscious choice to build the company. Like, and I think that's important because some people may just say, oh, look, I'm, I'm busy. I need to hire somebody. But like, you have to actually understand whether you want to build a company because when you hire that person, you said it, you're, you said almost, um, that person is, that's doing the acquisition stuff. Like they have their thoughts on how to, you know, maybe underwrite, but you have your own way. Right. And, and so you, Mm -hmm. whenever you hire somebody, you have to spend time with them to teach them, you know, and teach them the way that you want it done. And that you have to be ready to make that investment in those people. If you're going to hire people. That's right. And, uh, well, hiring people in general is expensive. I mean, there's, there's the cost of, you call it the W2 cost, but then there's, you know, I, now I'm I, where I was working at home. Now I have a, I, I office out of a WeWork. <laughs> so, and then there's like, I mean, I don't know, there's, there's, there's taxes associated with the, you know, the W2 employees. There's, I mean, there's all kinds of extra cost that go along with that. Um, not just time cost. So it's, it's certainly a commitment, but, um, you know, like they say, like you sometimes you, you're going up, but you have to go down before you can go back up again uh, at, at, a, at a bigger pace. And so that's that's kind of what the thought was is like, yeah, maybe I'll go backwards a little bit here um, for a few months. But I, I know this is going to be better for the long haul. Fantastic. Um, mindset. You know, a lot of people in this business talk about mindset. You know, one, you have to believe in yourself that, OK, you going from. 35 units to 200 and some odd units that you actually can do it. Right. You have to, if you don't believe it, how are you going to be able to, you know, attract other people into the deal? Um, and then mindset in terms of, all right, where do I want to go? Like it strategy and, and your, you know, plan for the future. It's not all about how much money am I going to make? Right. It's, it's, you know, you have to make a conscious choice and you have to believe that you're, you can build it. So talk about mindset and kind of how you, you've seen your mindset evolve over the last several years. 
So honestly, my mindset really started the shift when I actually started reading. Um, I I was one of those students that in college and high school or even several years after college just did not like studying. I don't know if it was the classroom environment or what. I just I didn't. I was like, I, I don't I don't like this. And then really it was uh call it maybe three to four years ago probably i i, be, I guess when i was started making a shift to, away from my corporate job was i just started reading books and um and listening to podcasts and, and learning and, and i found out that i actually and i actually do enjoy learning i just don't like the classroom setting kind of learning where i'm like where i have to go take a test or anything like something like that um, but now i i read about 30 books a year awesome. 30 books a year um, so as part of my morning routine is to read for about an hour. Uh, so whether it's a, a just any kind of personal development or business book. Um, so that's, that's part of my routine now. And, uh, I, I, I think that's really kind of helped shift my mindset a lot. Um, I know one of your guests just recently, <laughs> DeMarco, yes. uh, that was, uh, it was one of his books that I actually read that book like right before I actually left my millionaire W2. fast lane book. Yeah. He, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a great That's book. Right. And actually your, your business partner, Aaron Katz, he, he was the one that, yeah. um, you know, he put that out on Facebook and I, I went and got it for, for vacation. But I think like what you're saying, I completely agree. And I, I try to tell my kids cause you know, s- school kind of is a bummer. Like, you know, all the, all the mm-hmm. way through high school and even college, like, you have to sign up for these classes and you have to, you're, you're told what you have to read and what you have to learn and you have to take tests on it, but it becomes different when you're an adult and like you get to choose what you, what you want to read and what you want to learn about. Right. And right. That's when like, I'm like you, I love to learn, but I want to learn what I want to learn. I don't want to be told that's right. That's like, right. You have to be here at this time and you have to learn this and there's that's a right. test. You know, I want to learn because I'm interested in it. And that's what's great about yep. life is that there's like so many different avenues to go um and learn. But um you know, there you know, we talked about it early on, but you know, there's reading and there's learning, and then at some point you gotta take action or else you know, that learning just kind of stays in your brain, but you don't benefit from it yep. um, financially yep. at least. Uh, yep. That's a, I don't know. Maybe I'm just crazy. I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe a little bit of success kind of helps me take the next step. I'm not sure. Um, and I, another thing has probably helped me along the way too is, is my dad was an entrepreneur as well, which, you know, growing up, I know mean, they talk about nature versus nurture and whatnot, but um, I, I think that probably helped me a lot too. He had a, he had a business and then he sold a business when he was in his early forties, started another business and sold it when he was in his late forties and basically retired at that point. And, you know, from a, from an entrepreneurial an entrepreneurial standpoint, um, you know, he, one thing I really admired about him was that he was always there for us uh, as a family. Like, you know, he, he could go to our soccer games and, and go to the school stuff and whatnot. And, and I really think a lot of it was attributed to the fact that he had his own business. And so it, to me, it just kind of gave me um, encouragement, I guess, or uh, to, to, to do the same thing. And cause I, I wanted to be there for my family, want to be there for my family. And, uh, and I just think that this job uh, affords that to me. And um, that's so, yeah. huge. And the other thing is that, like you're building a company just like your dad, like he, he built a company. And then when, for whatever reason, maybe he just wanted to be in something else or maybe the price was right. But when you build a company, you can actually, you're building an asset that you could actually sell, you know? So, so you're mm-hmm. building value that you can actually sell when you're in a W2 job. The minute you leave, you don't get paid anything, right? You could be, you could be with a That's company right. for 10 years. They don't hand you a check when you leave. They're like, you know, they're you, right. not usually. Right. <laughs> I mean, look, there are some parachute, you know, yeah, big, big sure, CEO sure. <laughs> parachute packages and stuff. But, um, you know, in general, the employee is going to walk away and they're not, they're not going to make any more money until they go work for somebody else. Um, so I think that that's huge that you're able to, build value and then sell it. And then usually as you're growing that business, 
the value of that is continuing to increase over time. Um, and you're doing that with the, with the multifamily business. The other thing you said was a little success helps. And, and you know, and it may sound silly, but you know, I tell my kids that I'm like, look, look, Think about like one time that like you did something that you were proud that you did and you were, you were scared and you did it anyway and you, and you were happy you did it. Like you can look back on those things in your mind and help you the next time you're scared. Look, I took a chance before, you know, and maybe, you know, the chances that you took are bigger than maybe some other people that are listening, right? You know, you, you went and did a 35 unit property. Look, for a lot of people that that is mind blowing in itself. And then you went from a 35 unit mm-hmm. to a 200 and something unit. Um, and, and now you just did a 651 unit, but all those little incremental steps give you confidence, you know, to go after the next one. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I, if you'd have told me three years ago, I was going to be buying a 651 unit portfolio deal, I would have yeah, it's. I wouldn't have believed it. It's not. Or even, that you're gonna like hire three sense. people and build build a company. I know. <laughs> you know. I mean. I know. I know. Just it's it's unreal. Just kind of look back at the five years ago and and know where I was and and kind of look where I'm at now and it's just it's just not it's not comprehensible. I just I can't even well, comprehend. Well, one it. congratulations. Um, oh, look, I asked you on here because like I think that's very inspirational to people. I mean. Um, I, you know, look, I want to build wealth for my family and for ourselves. um, But I also want to inspire people, you know, like life is pretty short. And, and the people that I've interviewed that have taken some chances, they don't, they don't always work out the first time, you know, Um, but they're happy that they did it. And then they pivoted in something else or, you know, took it a second chance or third chance. And that's, you know, from a listener's perspective, what I would highly recommend is that if you have that itch in your gut, you know, whether it's real estate investing or starting a business or whatever, like you got to plan, you know, save up some money, do it at night, do it on the weekends, do something to give yourself a chance. You know, don't have regrets later in life. Yep. Yep. I would say uh, one, a couple of things that again, that helped me, we kind of touched on a little bit is that I actually wrote out what was the worst thing that could happen. Um, because and it, when you start thinking about like, what's the worst that can happen? Um, a lot of the thing it, it's, it's scary when you don't actually, it's scary in any situation, but it's, it's, it's more scary when you don't actually think about it through, like when you just think, Oh, what if I leave my job, I might be able to do this because I, because of whatever. But uh, when you actually start writing out like what's the worst that can happen, I think it it for me at least it took a lot of the fear away. And then, like you said, uh, also the other thing um, is plan it out. Well, I mean, I have a spreadsheet where I was basically looking at where are we at currently with all of our assets and what of our living expenses, what kind of money are we making already, and what is that like? Basically, how far can we go before I need to figure something else out? So essentially, we had a two year plan. If we weren't going to be able to make anything over two years, then at that point, I'd be like, well, it's time to go back and to try something else. But I but I knew that going into it as opposed to just, you know, hey, I'm going to go quit my corporate job not and not have any the slightest idea. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that, that's that's so. smart. And, and you you got your you got buy in from your wife, too. So you guys were you, you guys were in line <laughs> alignment. So that's, that's right. huge. Hey, why um, all your deals are kind of in Texas, right? Why? Why Texas? Um, you know, what's your what's your thought on Texas? Uh, so I, um, well, first of all, Texas there is a great go. state. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I live I live in uh, Frisco, which is North Dallas. Uh, for people who are did you grow uh, up in that Texas? are not in Texas? I did. I uh, grew up in Coppell, which is yep. also Dallas, and then um, moved to Frisco about six years ago now. Uh, but uh, I, I, I like that Texas is a landlord-friendly state. I like the, um, the population growth. Uh, and I like the uh, business growth here in DFW. Um, and I also like that it's in my backyard. Uh, I think it's, well, I think 
you know, I know people have, have purchased properties out of state and I'm not going to say that that's wrong or whatever, but for me personally, as an asset manager, you know, managing, you know, millions of dollars worth of people's money. Like I, I want to be able to know what's going on with that asset, like at all times. Um, the, the thing that keeps me up most at night is how, am I protecting my investors money? Um, like what am I what am I doing to ensure that their that their capital is is safe and that I'm not losing any money or or and so number my my rule number one is do not lose money rule number two is let's figure out how to grow this money, but I feel like I can do that best when I'm here, basically where I am you know call it fifteen thirty minutes away from from the assets that we purchase so. And, and DFW is just a great market, so I'm fortunate that I, I have the opportunity um, um, that basically all the stars align, essentially, that I live here, that it's a great market. Um, yeah, I mean, here. those are all great things. And when when you live in one of the best apartment investing markets in the country, it's like, why go elsewhere? You know? Yeah, yeah. So, and I'm not saying that I won't eventually one day buy outside the market, but I, I do think at that point, I'll have to have boots on the ground and some capacity in that location for me to really feel comfortable. Sure. But you'll have uh, had uh, experience like, um, with your asset manager here and how you, you know, how you, right. uh, train that person, how you groom them and how you oversaw, you know, oversaw the operations. And then that's going to make it easier for you to move into another location. Cause you're going to have something to, uh, kind of benchmark it off of. Sure. Yep. And, uh, in terms of also being in DFW and, and buying here, like as, if, as you know, you live in DFW, there's so many different pockets of DFW that you can't just say everything in right. DFW is good. I mean, you have to, you have to like know this market. And so for me, like if I went to, I don't know, somewhere in Florida, I may say, well, this area in Florida is a great area, but do I know what's actually on this particular block? Probably, Probably not. not. So but I think that I like what being, you would overcome, yeah. how you would overcome it is one, you have, you know, several years experience now on how you look at different, you know, markets. Sure. Um, and then two, you know, you, you built broker relationships where you probably could leverage those, um, you know, to they give you a contact that they trust in that market and then you know, there's some rub off of, of that trust level and, and you still have to, you know, get your comfort zone, but they could probably point you in the right direction saying, Hey, look, this is the part of town you want to be in this part of town. You don't want to be in, yeah. um, you know, funny Texas. So I'm an East coast guy from, from Connecticut, um, lived in South Florida for 13, 14 years. And then I've been here for 13, 14 years. Um, and I'm in prosper. So I'm just right next to you. Um, but mm-hmm. I always, you know, they always say like, it's, everything's always bigger in Texas. Right. And, and I remember when I got here, <laughs> it's even when you go to the sports bar, like you want, you want <laughs> small or big, small or large, like in for the, for your beer. And I'm like, how can you order a small yeah. in Texas? Like, I, you know, like you got to give me the big. Well, even the, sm- well, right. even the small, even the is, small large. is large, right? But <laughs> you, you ask, but like, you feel like oh, I'm in Texas. I got to ask for the large and then it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Hey, talk about, uh, networking and you know, what's the people talk a lot about networking and getting out there and going to conferences and, you know, um, going to meetups and, you know, what's the value to you and getting out there and networking? Uh, to be honest, it's one of kind of the weak spots that I've had is actually getting out and networking. I should be networking more. Um, to, to be honest, I think it probably had to do with kind of just being engulfed with my business, uh, being in the, in the weeds. And so, you know, as I've now hired some people, um, I do, uh, want to work on my business more. And I think that that's one of the ways that I could essentially work on my business more is going to more conferences and meetups and really kind of getting myself out there because, uh, you know, finding deals and finding money, that's, those are two big things. And, um, you can get both of those things by networking. And so I, uh, realized the importance of that and was one of the drivers for me getting and getting help. So talk about that. You, um, this, this business, people say it over and over and over again. It's, it's about finding deals, finding money. 
um, finding deals, finding capital. And, you know, I would put in a third is, is asset management. Um, cause I think that there's not mm-hmm. a, as much talk about that, but once you close on the deal, you know, you, you need people that are overseeing it. Um, but going to these conferences and networking, like how does that bring you more deals and more capital? Uh, that's a good question. Like I said, I haven't really done that much of that, so I don't really know the answer too much. I'll have to, I'll have to, maybe, maybe when we chat <laughs> over a beer in a few months or a year, I could tell you the answer well, to that question. Uh, well, I would add, but, um, that, I think it's uh, good. Just, you know, look, yeah. if you go and people one need to know what you're doing, right. And so if you go mm-hmm. um, to a conference and you meet passives that they want to be in, DFW, they want to be in, in deals, but they didn't know about Kurt, you know, you, you could end up getting yep. some additional passive investors that way. Um, sec- secondly, for sure, you know, I think the experienced folks, like most of these deals have, you know, partnerships that are formed and it could be, you know, two, two people, it'd be three. I mean, some of these larger deals could be five, six, seven, like, and, so people that go out and know that other people are interested in partnering and may not want to do, you know, be the lead person, um, get a smaller piece of the deal, but, you know, be a, be a part of it. Um, those people are out there and getting out there and meeting them as well can be beneficial. For sure. For sure. Um, I, I definitely see those things and, uh, what you're talking about there. And I just, honestly, I just need to get out and do it more. Um, it's, it's worked well, not so much being doing that as much, but, uh, yeah, and, I mean, and there's look, still ways that I try to promote my brand. Million. Like, How'd you do that? <laughs> where'd you, where'd you find all the people to invest with you, my man? <laughs> Uh, it's been years of building relationships. It's been years of building relationships, even before I started multifamily, to be honest with you. Um, you know, people invest with people who they know, like, and trust. And, um, that's, uh, you know, we've, it's, it's a lot of its relationships again, before I started multifamily. Um, and some of it's just people seeing the success we've had while we've been in multi. I mean, I have, I sold my first 35 unit deal. We made good returns, which that, that helped. And then, um, we have two deals that are currently selling right now that are, I mean, that'll be, you know, two nice. X <laughs> at least on some of them in, in really short period of time. So, um, you know, those, <laughs> that, that helps, uh, with the word of mouth and, um, also one of my guys that's on my team now, I've actually partnered with him on a couple of other deals. Uh, he's in a, in a major league baseball crowd circle, which has also helped. So we've got some, um, major league baseball players that, uh, are in our, um, uh, investor, uh, pool. Um, but I mean, really, again, it's just, it's, it's, it's word of mouth. It's, uh, people get more confidence in you and then they start spreading, spreading your name to others. And, um, that, no, that's huge. Yeah. Um, you know, for the listeners' benefit, I would I would say like wherever you are in this journey, start telling people what you're doing. You know, start telling people even if you're going to mm-hmm. do your first passive deal, like let people know um, because it can take years for people sometimes to build up that confidence. But then after a year or two. They, they may come to you and say like, look, I've been watching you. Right. And, and now I want to, yep. you know, learn more and maybe I want to invest. That's for sure. I mean, our first deal, um, you know, even it was a syndication and we, like, I still put a good chunk of the, of the down payment in that one. Um, but there was a lot of people that, that wanted to see me run that deal. They wanted to see how it went before they just, you know, gave you a $50,000 right. check or whatever. Um, and then, so, and it was really after, and then, and then some of the people who did invest in the second deal, there was small amounts. And, uh, I mean, I, there's, there's people that I know that maybe invested a hundred thousand in the first deal. And then in this last one, they invested almost a million dollars. So it's, uh, it's, it is a big difference. Um, but they've seen how I communicate with the investors. They've seen just things that we've, we've done, um, as an asset manager, which I think has helped, uh, yeah, it's, it's look. Just we we talk about snowballs, confidence 
and there's the confidence of the syndicator. You know, you're learning the business, you're growing, you're um, you're learning from experience, the bumps in the road. Um, but passives learn too, right? They they learn, mm-hmm. you know, what they like. You know, they if they've invested in five different deals, they like you know certain communication better than others, and you know they there may be some people that they're going to reinvest with and there's some people that they're not going to reinvest with. And so that says a lot about the confidence that they have in, in you that they've, some of them have upped their investment tenfold. So, you know, congrats. I mean, that's, that says a lot right there. Mm, Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, it's certainly not been easy along the way from it. Uh, And I think, you know, we've had some struggles under asset managing. We've learned a lot of stuff. And I think even, you know, I've been told by certain people that, like, for instance, on the the 265 unit deal, uh, I'm the primary asset manager on that deal. And I had to fire the management company basically four months into it. And I heard from several people that doing that gave them more confidence in me as an, as an asset manager to make decisions that are tough and, uh, and then communicate that clearly with the investors. And, um, I think certain things like that, I mean, just have, have helped along the way and that really that I'm, you know, paying attention to the asset and paying attention to their, their money and, and not just basically on to the next deal, essentially. That particular scenario I had to go through too. And, um, what, you know, what helped me, in making that decision, I was actually at a mastermind um, in Jamaica and I'm on a bus, like going, we're going to someplace fun and um, we're with a bunch of other syndicators and, and the conversation just came up about property management companies. And I was like, you know, look, is it, is it really that hard, you know, to, you know, to switch companies? And I had a number of people that were like, Darren, it really isn't. Like it, you know, it's, it's not like it's a cakewalk, but you know, if you in your gut feel like you need to make a change then make the change. And then I came back and I talked to my business partner and we made the change and and it, it's uncomfortable. You know, it's, it's like, you know, having to let somebody go or, you know, break up or whatever. But once you're done, right, you're happy that you, that you did it. And, um, and we ended up having a good result with the with the next property management company that came in. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. So, that's what awesome. are some of the other lessons that you said you learned a lot? You brought up that as one. And are there other uh, learning lessons that you can yep. talk about? So, sure. The first deal that we did, uh, we were undercapitalized. It ended up working out great, but I think if we had held the asset for another year, we could have run into some issues uh, because we. I, to be honest with you, at that point, I just didn't know. I didn't know that I needed more funds for deferred maintenance kind of issues. Like one of the issues that uh, when we sold that deal, like we knew that we were going to probably have to replace all the breaker boxes because they were the um, Federal Pacific breaker boxes and the insurance company was going to make us do that. Well, that was going to cost us like $60,000 and we didn't have that much money in the bank account. <laughs> so uh, we, there's just, uh, we ended up selling the deal before and still made... 70% return in less than two years, which is great for our, for our investors. And, um, but, uh, that was a lesson I learned. It's like, I will not be undercapitalized to get another deal. I will over raise if I have to, and it may affect the returns a little bit, but it is way more important to have money in the bank, um, than, than to basically stretch yourself, um, in that regard. So, so having enough money in the bank is, is important, not being undercapitalized, uh, the property management, that was a big thing that I mentioned, uh, essentially having the right property manager in place. Uh, so there, there are cheaper property management companies out there, um, but there, I don't know that it's worth the headache. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's to me, it's better to have a, 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 a professional, a, a, maybe a more expensive property management company out there that's going to get the job done because they're going to add value in ways that you may not be thinking yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm a believer um, in having high quality people, um, involved. I mean, even the, with the podcast, I have a consultant that I know I could find somebody cheaper, but he's provided so much value in terms of like, Hey Darren, you should, 
look into this software application. And like, if I was to research it myself, it would have taken me hours and hours and hours, or like, you should think, consider doing this or that. And that's value, right? You, you know, they see success from other people mm -hmm. and then they share that. So your property management company sees success at other properties and then they share it with, with your property. Um, that's huge. Um, so undercapitalized that, that was one, um, I wanted to ask you about financing because so I have another business. Mm -hmm. I've been in kind of in the loan trading business um, portfolios between banks since 2002 and started my own company in 2007. Um, during the great recession to whatever you want to call it, 2008, 2010, where I saw commercial deals go bad, have trouble were when the loan came due in a terrible economy. So, you know, these, for the listener's benefit, you know, these multifamily deals all have some kind of balloon feature. You don't, you can't get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. And so there's, sure. there's at, at some point the loan's going to come due and you either have to sell the property before that, or you have to refinance. And the last like year and a half has really been a bridge loan financing market you know three years plus two one-year extensions a lot a lot of deals um and mm -hmm. you know as long as you you are able to do the renovations and improve the property in that time frame everybody's golden but at some point you know it's the musical chairs stops and then somebody's get, you know, holding a, a deal where their their bridge loan is coming mm -hmm. due in six months, and all of a sudden now the economy's tank, unemployment's up, cap rates are up, cash flows down, valuations are down. Like, at, you know, so what's your take on financing? So our last two deals do have bridge debt on them. Um, it's not my favorite. But it's kind of the, like you said, it's kind of the environment that we're in right now. Um, I am, I am, I'm always, my ears are always on the ground for other options, but that's just kind of what there's out there, what, what's out there right now. So, but, but with that being said, uh, because we have these, I mean, we're doing things, we're trying to find ways to basically mitigate that, make risk. it less risky, uh, yeah, mitigating the risk. Like again, being overcapitalized, um, if I can help it. Um, and then, you, you know, obviously it's, it's three years and then the, the two one year extensions. And, and my, my plan is not, so I know some people underwrite and they basically show their projections as if they were to refi in year three and then call it a five year hold. I'm not actually going to my investors and saying these are five year holds. I'm saying these are three year holds. And then I anticipate trying to exit the gotcha. deal in two years. So that gives me a back, basically it gives so if year two comes along right. and the market's in shambles, well, then at least I have a year to figure something out before that first extension. And even then there's two, right. basically two extensions there. So I, 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 my plan on these bridge, these specific uh, two deals with bridge debt is to be out of these. So you get a shorter years. term focus um, on those. And then you, you also overcapitalize to, you know, mitigate some of that risk. When I, when I asked uh, Michael Becker, who's, uh, you know, I'm sure you know who he is, but for the listener's benefit, mm -hmm. he's, mm -hmm. you know, very, very big um, syndicator in the Texas market. And, you know, he said that when he, when he has shorter duration loans, he will have less leverage on the deal to mitigate that risk. So instead of doing a 75 or 80 LTV, maybe he's doing a 65 or 70 LTV, on that again, just to have a little additional buffer and you're absolutely right. I mean, look, sure. I've talked to a lot of syndicators and that's, you know, you could decide not to do bridge, but then you're probably not winning a lot of deals because a lot of these deals at the cost per unit, um, they just don't underwrite with the agency financing because of the debt service coverage ratio. Um, so, in any event, I'm, I'm thankful to, to get your perspective on that. I appreciate that. Um, hey, talk a yeah. little bit about, you know, why is, 
you see this quote that says 90% of millionaires have been created through real estate, right? And look, you're, you're seeing, you've got two deals that are, you know, two years in that you're, you're going to be flipping here shortly and, and you're going to have a nice payday for, you said two X for your investors and you as the sponsor, you know, you're going to have a nice payday as well. Um, why do you think that so many people can build wealth in real estate versus say the stock market? Uh, probably the leverage, leverage right? I would say. Uh, and then, I mean, that's, that's uh, other people's money, other, um, you know, uh, other people's time. Uh, I mean, a syndication essentially. And the is, loan, is, right? I mean, that's, the loan, the, you know, the, and 70, the loan, and the loan, seventy-five or eighty percent LTV, but all of the gain goes back to the equity owners. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, uh, yep. Uh, so, yeah, real estate definitely offers some opportunities there, and the fact, and it's and the the taxes too. I mean, I my, uh, I mean, the last several years, I haven't paid any taxes. So you know, that you know helps and it's too. funny it's funny you say that. I mean like I once I got involved in real estate, people started educating me and you know, somebody was like, Yeah, you have to read this book by Tom Wheelwright, Tax Free Wealth, I'm sure you know it. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I was reading it and, mm -hmm. and I felt like it was me in the beginning. It's like you know, a lot of Americans think that it's their patriotic duty to pay their fair share of taxes. And I was one of those and I was like I was paying significant i was writing significant checks to the government and mm -hmm. i was like well i'm fortunate that i can do that right we need roads we need but then yeah when you start to think about okay when you know he writes in the book look the, if you make this much money as a w-2 employee you pay this much tax but the other two thousand pages of the tax code are incentives that the government provides because they want you to invest in different areas of the economy and I think about these multifamily deals sure. and I'm like, you know, look, if, if there weren't these incentives, maybe, maybe not people would be investing in, in these, but you know, these properties are getting improved where, you know, they, they may just stay dilapidated, right? If, if they weren't, and so sure. you have tenants that are living in a better place, you have investors that are growing their wealth and, and then you're, you're providing, you know, low cost housing. You, yeah. Right. You're, you're stimulating the economy. Yeah, you're stimulating the economy. Yep. And paying then and property you're also taxes, paying property taxes. You're hiring people. So there's, there are know, taxes out there. You're hiring people. Right? Um, yep. you're, you're hiring rehab contractors to come out and, and you know, paint the property. And, you know, That's so right. All of this, you know, I didn't realize that. You, you, some people think like, oh, it's just a, it's an out, right? But it's. It's not. It's an incentive because mm -hmm. it does. It does stimulate the economy. I'm. I'm. A, I'm a believer in that. That's it. Um, so, hey, what's your next big stretch goal? <laughs> so, my uh, so basically, when I sat down with my team about a month ago, our goal for over the next year is to basically be at two thousand units. Uh, net. So I know we're going to be selling some units here. Um, so we want to be at 2000 units by 331, uh, 2023. And then the following year, we want to be at 3,500. And then our three-year goal is 5,000 units. That's huge. So that's, that's my, that, that's my stretch know, that's, goal. That's awesome. Um, you know, for listeners, if you don't plan, if you don't have goals, if you don't write them down, if you don't have a vision board, if you don't like, I would <laughs> highly encourage you to do that because if you don't do it, oh, yes. you're most likely not going to get to where you want to be. Yep. I completely agree with that. I, uh, in fact, you can't see it, but on the other side of your screen here, I have a whiteboard that basically has my top 10 goals for the year. And there's there's basically some faith goals. No, no and I'm, I'm, forgive me if I'm looking up there, but now there's, there's, yeah, there's faith goals and there's goals with my wife. Um, there's goals with my kids. There's income goals, personal net worth goals. There's reading goals. There's business goals. There's health goals. There's fund goals. Um, and then there's basically some, some other, uh, 
charitable goals on there. So, and then I have at my WeWork office, we have a whiteboard up there and that's when I was telling you about our stretch goals, they're, they're listed on that whiteboard as well. And I'm like you, I, I have to see them. Um, it keeps me re, um, reminded of these things. In fact, my whiteboard here at my office here, I actually uh, take a picture of it on a weekly basis and send it to three awesome. accountability partners um, that basically, yep, it's one of those things that uh, I think I read a quote one time. It said that you'll you're thirty something percent more likely to achieve a goal if you write it down, and you're seventy wow. something more likely to achieve it if you actually send it to somebody. And I can't remember exactly where that came from, um, but uh, but that was that was kind of an eye opener for me. Is like, well, okay, let's at least get it written down, and then let's start sending it to people um, so we can really have a shot at achieving these goals. And I've been doing this uh, for about three years now, and that that was one of the things when I left my corporate job. I was like, okay, I gotta like I gotta like shift my mindset and like how I do certain things. I need structure, and I want to like basically achieve something here. And how can I do that? And so, I mean, I really can't remember where the whiteboard idea came from, but uh, it was in one of the books that I read, and I was like, that's a great idea. And I had a space on my wall back here, and and since I worked from home at the time, I was like, well, I'm going to be looking at this whiteboard. Right. Basically all day long. So my goals are going to be on my mind all day long. And I don't know um, if this really has happened to you, but you like know, you, there's something I think about having an image too, that like, even when you're not in that room, you might be like laying down in bed or mm -hmm. even you might even dream about it. Like, but your mind is working on those <laughs> achieving those goals. Like, but if you don't, if you don't write mm -hmm. it down then there's no way it's going to happen. I had a guy on one time and he said he was doing multifamily investing and he said, okay, my goals were I'm going to buy a duplex this year and then next year I'm going to buy, you know, four units and next year I'm going to buy eight units and then 16 and then 32. And he got to year three, he did two and then he did four and he was on year three, which was going to be eight units. And he said, what if I just change this goal? And I said, what'd you change it to? He said 800 units. And I was like, you went from eight units <laughs> to 800 units? I'm like, where'd you end up? He said 464 units. Like, it's awesome. sure, he didn't hit the 800, but like, he, he had I know, eight, that's awesome. You yep, know, and he yep. would, you know, so that's. I know. Anyway, fantastic. That's awesome. Yep, no, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, set the goals high, and um, if you can't achieve them, it's all right. I mean, you'll probably still get way higher than what you would have if you didn't. I, I, you set know, the I've goals, never so. heard that. Um, uh, yeah, thirty percent, seventy percent thing, but I believe it. You know, I I believe it. I um, mm -hmm. I'm in the process of writing a book, which is uncomfortable. It's new. It's you know, and I hired somebody to help me. <laughs> um, but at the very end of it. I say like, all right, look, I'm telling you in the book, like to take action and to be accountable. And I said, here's three things that I don't, I haven't done before, but like I'm putting it in the book so that I'm accountable <laughs> that hopefully next time we talk, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, I've, I've accomplished one or two or three of those. So, um, I think that's important. That's, that's my homework. I'm going to find <laughs> good, that. And good. I'm gonna I want to, I, I want to see it. <laughs> Um, so awesome. Hey, if awesome. people want to get to know you better, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, Kurt Jordan, or you can go to my business page on LinkedIn, Jordan multifamily or my website, uh, www.jordanmultifamily.com. I am also on Facebook. Uh, but I have a business page there, Jordan Multifamily, or you can reach out on my personal page as well. Um, and I also have an Instagram page that I'm not really that active on, but I still am. Fantastic. Still have well, one, so. I appreciate you spending time with us here today. Um, listeners, I hope you enjoyed that one. I mean, this guy has done a lot in a short period of time and he has huge goals going forward. So um, if he can do it, you know, you can do it. I hope you enjoyed that one. So That's true. <laughs> That's true. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Hey. <laughs> but, but uh, Darren, really, I really appreciate it, Darren. This has been a lot of Absolutely fun. Absolutely, a lot of fun, and, and look forward to working with you. I, listeners, uh, until next week, sign off.
Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com slash learn.